Um, well, I just played drums, obviously, like I do in Ari's Kingdom, and um, yeah, it started way back in the day. Uh, I mean, I was just out of high school, which I graduated with Chuck, and uh, I got a call one day, and uh, Chuck says, "Hey, we're you know, me and this other guy are you know putting a thing together. Would you like to come over here?" And I said, "Yeah, why not?" Uh, and I was. Uh, went over listened to him play and it was you know it was music that i was not i personally wasn't uh i didn't listen to a lot uh it was new to me because you know i grew up in the you know the van halen the dock and judas priest kind of the the metal end of the spectrum and they, what they were writing was it was really revolutionary and something it sparked something in me and i was like i got a i think we should try doing something um, and it was, uh, you know, it kind of started from there, started slow. Um, but I mean, in, in the first few months, I think we, we really hit it off and it was, you know, it just went from there. It was a good process. Yeah. Tell me about those formative stages. <clears throat> well, in 1986, I was, uh, I was a big collector of Metallica albums and, uh, went to high school with a guy that worked with a guy that had a Metallica picture disc that I really wanted. And so I said, I didn't know the guy, so I said, well, get his number and let me call him. So I, guy got his number, I called him, had a conversation. You know, it's the typical thing. I mean, it's played out a million times in the metal world. Hey, do you like Merciful Fate? Yeah, I love Merciful Fate. You like Slayer? I love Slayer. What about Venom? Love Venom. You know, it's that kind of thing. And then by the time we got off the phone, I was in a band with him. And he said, well, we've got two guitarists, but we'll kick them out because you're coming in. Because these other guitarists just wanted to do like old heavy metal, and they wanted to do thrash. And uh, I wasn't a great guitar player. I'd only been playing about a year at that point. Um, but I went over and, and started playing covers with this band that included Pete. And we did stuff like Nuclear Assault, and Slayer, and Metallica, and, and Celtic Frost, and uh, Nuclear Assault, and Judas Priest, and Iron Maiden. We threw those in. And we were a really good party band, and it was a lot of fun. And that lasted about six to seven months, and then Pete and I started thinking, you know, dude, we need to do a little more than just covers. So he and I started writing on our own and pulling together songs and um, tried to get our drummer at the time interested, and he just, just wanted to drink Bush Light and party. And it was really frustrating for the two of us. And we had a, kind of had a an ultimatum with the guy and uh, just said you, know, you need to start you need to take this seriously or we're going to move on and then we had a disastrous party in the summer of 87 just everything fell apart and uh, i left that band and pete left that band and really what I, I say that we left but in reality i think you can also look at it as we kicked the other guys out and then we spent the fall of 87 just continuing to develop the material and looking for drummers and couldn't find any. I'm like, well, I played with this guy in high school. And Mike and I had played in, in early 86 together doing the, you know, Judas Priest and, and Metallica covers. And I had a tape of Mike and I playing. And Pete's like, yeah, he sounds great. Let's, let's see if he's interested. And so then called him up, like Mike said. And, you know, you know the rest of that story. So the name, Order from Chaos, where did this come from? It came from a conversation Pete was having with uh, one of our old friends. Uh, a drunken conversation. And I, I wasn't there, but... Uh, our friend said something about bringing order from chaos and in Pete's drunk mind at the time he's like hey that might be a great band name so he brought it to me he goes what do you think of that and I'm like I don't know I wasn't really wild about it but I couldn't think of anything better so ultimately that's just what it became by default <laughs> very unusual name at that time now, yeah, well, now a little bit well, more common yeah, I mean, and that, that's the other thing is that a lot of people thought we were a hardcore band and we didn't mind that because in Kansas City at the time there was no metal scene mm -hmm. I mean there was a metal scene but it was what what was on the national stage and the international stage so it was poofy hair and you know and, and it, was, it was hair metal mm -hmm. and that wasn't us and so we gravitated more towards the punk and hardcore side and we're basically accepted by those scenes so the fact that it had a hardcore feel didn't bother us at all. Um, so when you heard us, you're like, my God, this sounds like Destruction. It sounds like Sodom. It sounds like Bathory. You know, it, was, it, it all worked out. But you know, the, the name was, was actually the, 
it was misleading in in the best ways. <laughs> people would hear us and go, "Well, that wasn't what I was expecting at all." Mm -hmm. And you remember those kinds of bands? Cool. You did a bunch of demos. You want to show like the the CD that has all the demos on it, right? Yeah. Okay, and so, tell me about uh, maybe a few of those. Uh, we did well. Demo one was just recorded in my parents' garage, and that kind as of as it should be. <laughs> yeah, and it, it it got us on the map. And we did demo two at a studio out in a suburb of Kansas City, and that was <laughs> I won't I won't call it professional. It was semi pro because it was it wasn't pro, uh, <laughs> but it came out all right. And then the third demo we did, I was dating a girl. Her father had been in a band called Missouri, so he had this great recording studio in his basement. And he loved us because we were a big middle finger to the local scene. And so he wanted to record us and take care of us and you know, help us out. And so he recorded both our third demo and then our first seven inch in his, uh, in his basement studio. That gets us to the first album. Yeah, Stillbirth Machine, which um, we had written it, uh, had all the songs ready, and the the brother of, of the guy that we had done the demos in the 7-inch with, he was also in a, in a you know, pretty popular uh, band at the time, and he had also had a studio in his uh, his house, but it was uh, technically it was a much better studio. Uh, you know, a bigger board, more equipment. Uh, you know, an isolated room, the whole nine works. And <clears throat> so we, uh, you know, having very limited recording experience, uh, just went in uh, and, and and recorded it. Um, and we were uh, kind of <clears throat> got the, you know, we have unlimited time and it kind of got to our heads a little bit. And uh, I, I think we kind of, um, the production's not what we wanted. Uh, I think that we I just. That was my fault. No, I think we just let other people talk us into things that, you know, we should and shouldn't do. and. We always had a pretty, you know, strong opinion about what things would sound like. However, um, this is one of those records that, you know, it, it, in the annals of time, people, you know, it's they either really love it, they think it's groundbreaking, or they think it's that weird sounding <laughs> kind of spaceship sounding album. But I, I still love that record. I really do. Uh, there, there's, it's. I mean, it's so off the beaten path from what was coming out during the day that I, you know, I didn't know, you know, if it would get us anywhere, but I was, I was proud of it at that point. <clears throat> How did you follow it? <clears throat> what do you mean? Like the, with the second album. Oh, well, I'm not even done talking about that one. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> so I hated the guitar sound. Okay. Um, I recorded a, one version of it and I thought it was horrible. So I re-recorded the guitars, and I didn't do any better. But ultimately, we just had to move on with what I had and make the best of it. It was, it was, it was pretty painful, and I was at war with that album for years. And it's only in the last couple of years that I've really kind of accepted it and said, okay, well, a lot of people like it. You know, it was the same with Bathory. Corthon never really liked Under the Sign of the Black Mark that much, but everybody else loved it. So you just have to give up at a point, a certain right. point, go up. All right, it's great, whatever, you know, and uh, and and move on. So um, that's really what happened. There's a lot of stories behind the recording of, <laughs> of Stillbirth Machine, um, a lot of funny adventures, but uh, maybe those were for another time. <laughs> so we followed it up with Dawnbringer. There it is. Um, no, actually, we followed it up with the Plateau of Invincibility EP, and this is where we changed studios to another home studio that uh, we remained at all the way through to the end of the band and into early Aries Kingdom. Um, the, anyway, the Plateau of Invincibility was where we, I feel like we really took our, our own steps and took hold of what we were going to do, what we knew we were capable of, but weren't quite there yet on Silverth Machine. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of learned how to do it on our own. 
at that point when we had moved to that studio because you know we had picked up you know things that we needed to do as far as you know the setup when you set up drums and set up the guitar how do you place mics and all that we had you know intently learned how to do all that and then by the time we had done that and we got to plateau we had a rough idea uh how to record uh but we you know we still were it was in the infancy stages and we still had to learn how to uh you know mix uh you know there was a lot of things we still didn't know but we it was a learning process that um you know unknowns to us you know we actually really enjoyed it i mean you know it had its ups and downs but we got through it the biggest difference between silver machine and, and plateau is that in terms of the studio technology capability it was halved for plateau i mean silver machine was recorded on 16 tracks 24 tracks i think 24 mm -hmm. tracks mm -hmm. um you wouldn't think it to listen to it but it was um Everything from Plateau on was recorded on eight tracks. And how on earth do you do that? But I was buddies with Corthon of Bathory, and he was a master at taking you know, 16 tracks and making them sound like 64. Mm -hmm. And so you know, we would talk about how do you do that? And he's like, well, I will record you know, 16 tracks, and then I'll mix 12 of them down to two, and then I'll use those remaining tracks, those, those 12 tracks, for, for new recordings, and then I'll mix those down, and then I'll just keep mixing down until I've got something that sounds like it was recorded on a 64-track board. I'm like, well, we can apply that to what we do, mm -hmm. and so that's what we did. And it, there's a lot of limitations to that, and you suffer because of it, but if that's all you've got, that's all you've got. And so from Plateau on, all the way up through an ending and fire, everything was done on eight tracks. Um, and you know, Dawnbringer was one of those albums where it was actually meant to be an EP, but the Dutch label that we signed with really wanted to do an album, so we threw some stupid filler on there and um, it became a record. <clears throat> call it an album. Um, but you know, like uh, Tenebrae was on there, and that that got its ultimate version on the last album, An Ending in Fire, which is what Mike talked about. All right, last album, Ending in Fire. Um, like Chuck there said, Dawnbringer was not really meant to be a record, whereas this we fully intended it to be. We wrote strictly for that purpose and um, we went into this knowing um, and purposely determined that this was going to be it this is you know we were going to do three albums and kind of call it a day so the songs on this um, there's a lot of really really good songs one of my favorites is one of the long ones is their lives your lord father victories which is took us a long time to learn. I mean, it's a long song, but ultimately uh, a very, I think a very powerful record and some, some say our best. Um, you know, I'll leave that up to, you know, the, the fans, but uh, I think overall, all wise, the production, the songwriting, everything was made this a very complete record uh, and, a, and a fitting one to, to kind of you know, in the career centers. And why did the <clears throat> break up? Well, from the very beginning, you think back to the late 80s, especially 87, when we were putting the band together, a lot of the bands that we looked up to putting out third albums or fourth albums, it just sucked. And, you know, Pete and I were looking around going, if we do a band and it goes anywhere, we don't want to become, you know, one of these footnotes or one of these uh, these bands that disappointed the fans. So. We determined we're going to do we're going to do two or three albums and then we're going to quit and that's it. It's a really high-minded idea for a bunch of you know, teenagers to come up with, but mm -hmm. that's ultimately the plan that we stuck with. And it was hard at the end, you know, because OFC was finally achieving a little bit of notoriety. Mm -hmm. It's not like people cared a lot. I mean, we were never a band du jour, never really super popular. Uh, but like Mike said, if you liked OFC, you really liked OFC. If you got it, you got it, mm -hmm. and. Um, it was just, by the time it came to let the band go, it, was, it, re it really was time. I mean, you, you, you think about the concepts on this album, the scope of this album, it really does, it is an inning in fire. It was the, it was the appropriate time to put the band to bed. And, um, and I'm really happy did. with that, yeah. 
Um, tell me about your friendship with Quartan. Oh, <laughs> well, I, you know, I heard Bathory back in the 80s, and I was fascinated. I think there's so much mystery around him. And it's just like, I like to demystify the world. Uh, just de so I wrote him, just trying to get the measure of what is this guy about. And uh, he wrote back, and so I wrote him back, and he wrote back, and it just kept going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And over time, we just got friendlier and friendlier and more open with each other until we just became buddies and knew everything about each other. And uh, that went on until his death. Um, so, I mean, what is there to tell? I mean, just, you know, it's like an old, a pen friendship that just got out of hand. And uh, I was just really lucky to know the guy because he had a lot of wisdom and a lot of, experience, a lot of experience that I certainly didn't have. And, you know, knowing his background uh, in the music industry vis-a-vis -vis his father, I mean, there's a lot to learn from him. Um, and the fact that he kept, and it's not like he tried to remain mysterious. I mean, he, there were a lot of things that he said in the press that were absolutely true. He was also a storyteller. He also liked to make things up just to see if people would believe them. Um, but uh, he was just one of those guys who was so much to learn from. And there's so many layers to him. He was like an onion. You just <laughs> keep peeling away these layers. And in the end, there was just a very normal, average guy that had the same hopes, desires, frustrations um, that the rest of us had. And, you know, his own quirks. He certainly had, he certainly had his own quirks. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the long and short of it. Yeah. Um, shortly, when you look back at uh, Order from Chaos, what mm -hmm. comes, comes back to you? Um, you know, at the time when we did it, uh, I mean, we were young and we were having a lot of fun. Uh, like Chuck said, we didn't get to play very many shows, uh, but the ones we played were, you know, they were just insane. Um, we certainly didn't, I mean, think that, I mean, late, you know, lately, you know, especially on this tour, we've had kids come up to us and, you know, calling us legendary and, you know, they're having to sign these, you know, records and CDs and such, which, you know, is, it's, 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 it's a thing. Uh, it's not really something I enjoy, but you know, I I, I want to accommodate anybody uh, because I've had you know, there's people that I thought were legendary and I thought were formative, and if that's uh, what um, a you know a kid or somebody else in a band you know and hears us playing and says, "Ooh, I want to do that," I I'm all for it because I think creativity is 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 a huge part of our lives, and that's. I, I don't want to stifle anybody's creativity, uh, but it was, it was you know we had a lot of fun. It was a very short period, uh, you know, six or seven years, and um, like I said, we didn't get to do very much. But it seemed like we packed a lot in in that short time we had. Uh, and obviously, it, you know, Pete went on to do great things. He did Angel Corpse and some other projects, and you know, we've done AK for the last twenty two, three years, um, and, uh, you know, we have no plans on stopping. I mean, you know, death or old age or something might stop <laughs> us, but, you know, we're, we, we still enjoy it. Uh, it's, you know, we've never, you know, we've never kidded ourselves. It's not going to, we're not going to get famous. We're not going to make a lot of money, uh, but uh, we enjoy doing this, and we, you know, I've made a lot of friends over the years, uh, a lot of lifetime friendships, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Cheers.